in one of the darkest times in human history, when the voice of God was silent for 400 years. Suddenly, without notice and without provocation, redemption came to all men. And on an old rugged cross, on the stony hills of Calvary outside of the city of Jerusalem, the sins of mankind were redeemed one final time as God expresses his love for all of man when he poured his wrath on his son at a cross and it appeared that evil had won he rose and he was resurrected he lives that we may live Today I want to speak to you about a subject that is more controversial than any that I can think of in the Christian faith, with the exception of a couple of others. But this one really can be very divisive when it was intended to be very unifying. I want to speak to you today about Pentecost. and We're going to introduce this message to you with one verse. It's Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come... That's vitally important in understanding the historical and prophetic significance of what the day of Pentecost truly is. Let me finish the message and the part of the message that we are all familiar with. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, emphasizing fully come, they were all in one place in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound of a mighty rushing wind from heaven, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared cloven tongues like unto fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Father, in the name of Jesus, it is my intention and purpose that today by the Spirit of the Sovereign God, according to the Word of God, that we present an accurate and thorough and easy to understand perspective of why this word means what it does biblically, that it may touch the lives of those who are lost and struggling and empower your church to be strengthened with might in their inner man. That your plan and your purpose as intended through your word is not manipulated through the, int the intentions or thoughts of human ingenuity or intellect. Today, Father, we, Darren and I, both surrender ourselves to you. We submit ourselves to your authority. We ask that you put your hand upon our head and press down. Stir up the gift of God that lives and abides in both of us, Father, Lord God, to present this gospel to a world that so desperately needs to hear it with the power which you ordained from heaven for us to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he remained with his disciples 40 days. And after the 40 days, he ascended unto the Father, where he remains to this day, as all who take his name anticipate with great joy his eminent and glorious return to earth for us. But before he ascended to Father... He required them to wait at Jerusalem and wait for the giving of the Holy Spirit before they were to fulfill the Great Commission. He spoke of this specifically and distinctly through, the, through Luke, the great physician. In Acts 24, verses 44 through 49, the Bible says that he said unto them, These words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, meaning before the death and resurrection. In other words, before he went to the cross. These words that I spoke unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled that are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning him. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved that Christ should suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, 
And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in all nations beginning here at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of the Father unto you. But tarry here in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, the Bible says, And he said unto them, These, he said, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Understand, he said it then, and he is now saying it again. For John, verse 5, and this is vitally important, for John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were therefore come together, they asked Jesus, Will thou at this time restore the kingdom of God to Israel? And he said, It is not you know, the times or the seasons which the Father hath put under his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted into a cloud out of their sight. And behold, there were two men that stood beside them, saying, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, who you have seen lifted up, shall also appear in like manner. And thus began the birthday of the church of Jesus Christ. But what's the significance of Pentecost in these series of events? Have you ever truly thought about that? On the outward appearance, the Pentecost celebration is a Jewish celebration that was accompanied by a lot of activity. It was, so it would provide, provide the perfect backdrop for a field white for harvest and 3,000 souls entered into the kingdom of God on that very day. But again, why did it happen on the day of Pentecost. Why is Pentecost so important and a priority of God himself? Pentecostalism is the first day of the existence of the church. The day of Pentecost is also the first day of the introduction of church evangelism, outreach ministries, and all missionary endeavors for the gospel. It is literally the birthplace of all, who we are and all that we do. Now, I want to explain to you there's two forms of Pentecostalism. There's Orthodox Pentecostalism, which stays close to the word. And there's Neo-Pentecostalism, which is much of what la the landscape of the Church of Pentecost is in this world. It, it, takes it takes parts of it and dilutes it, and then it uses other parts. But is there a truth in the middle, biblically, that we can follow and trust? And I believe there is. First of all, there is an Old Testament reason it exists, and there's a New Testament reason it exists, and there's a reason why Christ prescribed Pentecost as the way to reach this world for his kingdom. It's a simple formula. It had something to do with the Old Testament, it has something to do with the New Testament, and it applies to the way you do things at your church now and going forward. The word Pentecost refers to 50 days in the Old Testament. The day of Pentecost is directly linked to the Jewish festival Shavuot. It is also known as the Feast of Weeks. And there are some references in newer translations called the Feast of Pentecost. This festival is important because it commemorates when God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, an event that occurred 50 days after the final Passover when the Jewish people were freed from bondage and enslavement from the Egyptians. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, Three times a year shall your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall appear before the Lord, not empty, or bringing an offering." The feast of first fruits acknowledged that the fruit of the ground came solely by the provision of the Lord and occurred in conjunction with the feast of unleavened bread, 
which was introduced by the Passover. The first fruits would be consecrated to the Lord. This points to the New Testament believers' dedication to the Lord in all their lives. Christians are the first fruits of God's saving works. You understand? You are the first fruits of God's saving works. Notice how these festivals are interwoven with each other during that week. The liberation of, of the Christian from damnable sin, and then the first fruits, everything that you manifest because of that, work together to glorify God in everything that we say and do. The Feast of Weeks, which is seven times seven Sabbaths, after that, you understand, that means a day of jubilee. I'll speak to that in just a minute. The Feast of Weeks, seven Sabbaths from the Passover, occurred at the end of the wheat harvest. Days, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, on this day, God gave thanks for, on this day, God's people give thanks for his abundant gifts of food and for all that sustained them. It was this day that God poured forth his Holy Spirit upon all of Christ's disciples. Pen Passover and Pentecost marked the beginning and the end of the grain harvest. Over time, Old Testament Pentecost weeks began to be celebrated as the anniversary feast of the establishment of the covenant and the giving of the law by God to his people. In other words, it celebrates the law that God brought down from the mountain for his people. The covenant law of God that he gave to his people, which is so familiar in all Hebraic language, narratives, and literature, and so spoken of, came upon this day, traditionally this day, in Jewish history. If the Old Testament was an annual celebration of the first covenant, then Pentecost in the new, in the new covenant is a celebration of the new covenant. The doctrine of the new covenant began with the prophet Jeremiah when he said, and I quote Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and it shall come to pass afterwards, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judea, not according to the covenant that I made with them, when I, with their fathers, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward man, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall no more teach every man to his neighbor and every man to his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, and I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jesus Christ would establish this covenant during the last blessed Supper Passover, in his declaration in Luke 20, 2, verse 20. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament, or the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24, the Apostle Paul also reiterates the words that were spoken in a much, much easier way. It says, After the same manner he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament, in my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. With the words New Testament in my blood, Jesus announces the inauguration of the New Testament or covenant based on his sacrificial death and resurrection. Scripture teaches that the New Testament, the New Covenant could only become valid by the death of Christ. The disciples entered into this New Covenant when they were regenerated and indwelt on the evening of Jesus' resurrection when he appeared unto them. In John chapter 20, verses 20 and 22, 21 and 22, then Jesus said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. After the new covenant would be proclaimed at Pentecost that remains to this day, it is important to note that New Testament Pentecostalism was only intended to be a celebration and remembrance of the covenant that Christ had already fulfilled. The manifestations that occurred at Pentecost were a confirmation of their salvation. They were never intended to be a source or a way to their salvation. That was accompanied and fulfilled by Christ on the cross and the resurrection, which afterward subsequently came after. Salvation is only obtained and absolutely fulfilled by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ by our willingness to believe on him for the rest 
of our lives. In Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 40, the Bible says, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when everybody in the crowd heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? And Simon Peter answered and said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God himself shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, save yourselves from this evil generation. Central to the book of Hebrews is the establishment of a better covenant based on better promises. In Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, once again, this sounds like the Jeremiah covenant prophecy being fulfilled that I just quoted to Jeremiah in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. He says, for finding fault with them, he said, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judea, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, write it upon their hearts, and I will be unto them a God, and they shall be unto me a people, and they shall not teach any man his neighbor or every man his brother. Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more." In Hebrews 9, 15 through 18, the confirmation of Jesus as the testator of the new covenant. In verse 15, for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Not Mary, not Joseph Smith, not the watchtower, not Mohammed. There is no way to God except through Jesus Christ, the suffering son of God and the resurrected savior of the world. He is the mediator of the new covenant God established with mankind once and for all his death and resurrection has settled the wrath of God towards man who receive it by faith. Verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also be the necessity of the death of the testator. For a testament is not a force after, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Central to the Old Covenant are the consistent references with Pentecost to Jubilee. The word Jubilee, as it relates in the Old Testament, has four distinct characteristics. Number one, God freed the slaves out of Egypt. Number two, all of their debts were forgiven. Number three, he had fulfilled his promise to give them the Holy Land and number four, he gave them rest. In the same manner, all men are afforded these promises in the New Covenant. How does the New, the New Old Testament example or type or shadow of Jubilee apply to Pentecost in the New Testament? Number one, when you preach the gospel and men receive Christ, they are freed from the slavery of sin, just as you are free from the slavery of sin. In John 8, verse 36, the Bible says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. In Romans 8, 15, the Bible says, For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In Galatians 3, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Number two, the, the price for your sin has been paid. Your sin has never been forgotten. No sin will ever be forgotten in the sight of a holy God. Do not let contemporary ministers kid you that it's okay for you to behave any way you want and God is going to be all right with that. Yes, God loves you. God loves you more than you'll ever know, but he is not going to accept you in your sinful nature, never has, never will, do not let people that aren't supposed to be doing this cloud your judgment and keep you from this promise. The price of your sin has been paid. As in Jubilee, all the debts were forgiven, so 
and Pentecost, whoever receives the gospel, their sin has been paid. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us. The word redeemed means that a ransom was paid. You were dead to your sins, but a ransom was paid, and now you're reconciled to God. The punishment of the sin still happened. It just happened to Christ. Now, let me not confuse you here with some of the jargon that's going on here. Christ did not, was not, did not do those sins to be punished for. He took your sins as a sinless lamb and was sacrificed for your sins. He never committed those sins. He was sinless on this earth. He took your sins, your sins on the cross and paid the price for your redemption. You are redeemed because of that. You have no access to God without this transpiring ever. Doesn't matter if you speak in tongues. Doesn't matter if you pastor a church. I don't care. It's not a birthright. It has, there's a process God put in place for the redemption of mankind, and you cannot shortcut it just because you think it can build a crowd. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. In Ephesians 1.7, the Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 1 Corinthians 6.20, you are bought with a price. In Revelation 5, verse 9, to whom has slain and redeemed us to God by his own blood. He, number three, you have a coming city whose builder and maker is God. In Hebrews 11, verse 10, the Bible says, we look for a city whose builder and maker is God. And in Revelation 21, verse 2, two through 4, the scripture says, and I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a great voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will be their God and dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more th pain for the former things have passed away number four Christ is a rest from your labor the striving to find peace the endless search for hope the mindless messages of encouragement that come from well-meaning but misdirected people your peace comes, your rest comes, your hope comes in Christ. That's one of the promises of Jubilee. It's one of the promises of Pentecost in the New Covenant. In Matthew 11, 28 through 30, the Bible says, Come unto me. This is Christ's first invitation. invitation. This is Christ's first invitation in the Bible. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In Hebrews 4, verse 9, the Bible says, There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. The day of Pentecost was characterized in its uniqueness by its distinct Holy Spirit manifestations that would symbolize the introduction of the church to the world. First, there would be an there was the sound of a violent rushing wind that filled the house. Then there was the visible sign of cloven tongues of fire resting on each person. Finally, there was the miraculous speaking in foreign and heavenly language, which none had previously known. Again, in Acts 2, 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat on each of them. And they, began, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. On Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. When suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them, appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The sound of a violent rushing wind is primarily a picture of invisible power. The wind is something that no one can see but is still capable of exerting incredible power as in a tornado or a hurricane. The disciples heard the noise, but there was no indication that they felt it blowing. It was a miraculous sound that came from heaven. 
Both the Hebrew and the Greek words for wind and spirit mean the same. In Genesis chapter 2, mankind became a living being by the breath of God in the nostrils that he had created. Genesis 2 verse 7, And the Lord God formed the man out of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. In Ezekiel 37 verses 9 through 10, he says to the prophet Ezekiel, Prophesy under the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord, Come upon the four winds and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came upon them, and they lived and stood on their feet. In John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, Jesus answers it, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you be born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Now listen to what verse 8 says. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and you hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell where it came, and you know, whether, whether it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Spirit-filled people are confusing to the world. They're looking for physical manifestations, and they are only applied through the application of the Word of God. You must understand that the spirit represents life because God breathed in the breath of man, except the man is born of the spirit. The, the, the aspect of wind in the process is the new life, the new birth, the new hope, and the new power at Pentecost because it was like a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Notice what he said. The second phenomenon was the appearance of cloven tongues of fire resting upon each person in the room. Throughout the Bible, fire symbolized God's presence, holy presence. Moses in the wilderness saw the bush that was burning but not consumed. God himself was in that bush. Israel was guided and protected in their exodus by a pillar of fire, which was God. John the Baptist preached that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus said that he had come to cast fire on the earth. The final place of judgment is a lake that burneth with fire forever. Hebrews states, our God is a consuming fire. Fire brings both heat and light. The heat of fire consumes the impurities who come into contact with it or destroys those who have no gold in them. The heat of fire also pictures the zeal that should mark believers who are hot and not lukewarm in their devotion to Christ. The light pictures the illumination of God to all that are in spiritual darkness. The fire on the day of Pentecost appeared in cloven forms in the form of tongues to symbolize the fire on the day of, excuse me, the fire on the day of Pentecost appeared in the form of tongues to symbolize God's power through the proclamation of his word, burning into all people and that it purifies them from their sin. That's why the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When God's word is proclaimed with the holy fire of the Holy Ghost and the holy fire of the Holy Ghost infiltrates the hardened hearts of men, it exposes their sin and opens the door to potential salvation through Jesus Christ and to those who would never have thought they would ever meet him in that way. Paul later stated the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. The gospel must be verbally proclaimed for the power to manifest. In other words, you're not going to manifest the power of God in the vernacular and the narrative in most churches right now. I got nothing against any of y'all. But what happened to the fire of Pentecost? What happened to the power of the Holy Ghost? Your world is trampling us underfoot. And who's going to stand up and be a watchman and say, Thus saith the Lord, except you repent and be born again under the fire of the Holy Ghost, the world will ever hear the message and we will be judged for our cowardice. Lastly, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Jesus, 10 days earlier, on the Mount of Olives, before his final ascension to the Father, told them they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now here we go. True speaking in tongues, the Greek word glossolalia, your prayer language, is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, i.e. a Spirit-filled utterance, whereby the believer speaks in a language, Greek glossia, he has never learned. Now this is very important that you understand this. 
because this is the biblical interpretation of this. Scripture defines it as either an existing spoken language or language is unknown on the earth. It is not a static speech as rendered in some newer translations. The Bible has never used a static speech ever in any Greek references in referring to this manifestation. Tongues are the initial outward evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues has inspired, is an inspired evidence whereby the spirit and the believer join in verbal utterance, usually associated with prophecy and or praise. The New Testament church is filled with examples of this manifestation. And before I begin this, let me share this with you because I've been hammered on this for years. There is no evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, first of all, without coming to the cross and having your sins forgiven, or the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, as outlined in the Scripture. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. And when someone comes to you and says you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit any other way than the biblical pattern outlined, they are heretical, and at the very most innocent of this is ignorant, and the worst is this is a demon spirit sent. There is no place in this, outside of this, as the church... Yes, they did miracles in the journeys when Jesus was on this earth. But since Jesus left this earth, he designated that the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit would be the primary indicator, number one, in a believer, and number two, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as outlined in Acts 2, Acts 10, and Acts 19. And there are no excuses when three examples of Scripture clearly illustrate God's pattern for how this should work for some well-meaning but ignorant person to come along and say, well, God can do anything he wants. Well, God can write any book he wants, but he wrote this book and he limited himself to this book so that you would know it was him and not some counterfeit. And when God writes something in scripture that says these illustrations are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit as the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there is no other argument to be made about it. Tongues are the initial evidence of the speak, baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues is an inspired evidence whereby the spirit of the believer and the Holy Spirit join in a verbal utterance usually associated with prophecy or praise. The New Testament church is filled with examples of this manifestation. Jesus himself said in Mark 16, verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. In my name they shall cast out devils. Acts 2, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 10, verse 46, for they heard them speak with other tongues and magnify God. By the way, this is the first illustration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit being poured on the Gentiles and adopting them into this wonderful gift of God for the proclamation of the gospel. In Acts 19, Verse 6, the church at Ephesus, when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Ghost began to speak, came upon them, and they spake with other tongues. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10, the Bible says, to another, diverse kinds of tongues. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, the Bible says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, the Bible says, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not to man, but unto God, for no man understandeth. How be it in the spirit he speaks mysteries to God 1 Corinthians 14 verse 5 I would that you speak with tongues but rather that you prophesy 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15 I will pray in the spirit and I will pray in the understanding I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding Ephesians 6 verse 18 the Bible says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints in Jude chapter 20 Praying in the Holy Ghost. The tongues which were given at Pentecost are a gift of the Holy Spirit to us. This gift has two main purposes. Number one, speaking in tongues is used by the believer to speak to God in his or her personal devotions and thus to build up one's spiritual life. It means speaking at the level of the Spirit for the purpose of praying, giving thanks, or singing. Number two, speaking in tongues accompanied by interpretation in the corporate church setting and public worship services to communicate the content of the utterance to the congregation 
in order that all may enter into the Spirit directly into praise, worship, or prophecy. This must always, this second gift must always be accompanied by an interpreter. It must always be accompanied by an interpreter. It must be understood and recognized that the mere occurrence, and I want you to listen to this very carefully, because not everybody that speaks in tongues is even saved. It must be understood and recognized that the mere occurrence of speaking in tongues or any other supernatural manifestation is not absolute or uncontestable evidence of the work and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues can be, and in this day and age usually is, counterfeited by human initiative or demonic activity. The Bible tells us not to believe every spirit. In 1 John 4, 1 through 4, you should make this one of your memory verses. Beloved, believe, first, let me just say, 1 John 4, 1 through 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And is that spirit of Antichrist, where have you heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Speaking in tongues must be the spontaneous result of the infilling of initial filling of the Holy Spirit and continue under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is not a learned phenomena, nor can it be taught by instructing believers to speak incoherent syllables. God always reconciles them that love him back to himself. He will establish his place in our hearts and souls and is always found faithful to his people. The promise of the role of the Spirit was outlined in the book of Joel as a source of hope. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And upon the servants and the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned in the darkness, and the moon and the blood before the great and the notable day of the Lord comes, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Lastly, Pentecost is not just the genesis of the church of Jesus Christ. And that's vitally important. It is also the origin of missionary preaching, outreach preaching, and the advancement of the gospel required of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taught that everything you do for him, you speak his name wherever you go. It's your call to preach. You're called to teach. You're called to lead people to Christ. That is not the pastor's job to do that. The pastor's job is to prepare you to do this so that you can do that. And obviously, as, it does, as, it, as an opportunity presents itself, he should do the same thing. In Matthew 10, verses 7 through 10, the Bible says, And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven. You know, preaching, right? the word preach right now is a dirty word in most churches. Preaching is what gets to the core of the matter through the use of the Holy Spirit. Preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You don't hear that preach very much anymore. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass for your journey, for your purses. Neither script, neither two coats, neither shoes nor stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. If the preaching of the gospel is not your motivation for doing this, then for heaven's sakes, don't do it. Don't let what you see on some television distort this because of the appearance of their success. Are you preaching the gospel? Matthew 28, 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came unto them and said unto them, All power is given to me under heaven and the earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. In Mark 16, verses 15 through 17, and he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing that shall not hurt them, they shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I have reviewed the other scriptures beforehand. I did this. This was a burden on my heart because I'm tired of seeing what I'm seeing. Pentecost has a proper place. There is a place clearly in the scriptures that it's meant to be. There is also a book in the Bible that addresses a church that abuses these gifts in 1 Corinthians. The no longer, the Bible hadn't even completely written and a church had gone astray on this. This is not a game. This is the power to see your ministry fulfilled. This is not an agent of salvation. You should already be saved at the cross at this moment. It is a subsequent moment. And I want to be very clear about this because I'm sure I'm going to get plenty of hate mail. But the truth is the truth. Jesus Christ did not die so that we could choose another way to besides the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is the agent of salvation. It's the way you get into the kingdom of God. And Pentecost is the celebration of that and the empowerment for the preaching of the gospel. First and foremost, all of the other things that transpire, worship, church, the evidence of the miracles, the gifts of healing, all of the things that are prominent are absolutely true, but they are initiated here. They begin here. They're introduced here. God introduces new life to everything. This is how he introduces new life to the church. This is not to be debated. This is not debatable or a point of contention. This is how he did it scripturally. I have walked you through the scripture. What does this all mean? What this means is within the sound of my voice, there are some people that are going to die and go to hell today if they don't hear the gospel. So let me present to you that opportunity to avoid that terrible fate. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have not passed through an old rugged cross and entered through the blood of Jesus Christ into all this Bible says you can be or hope to be, you can make that right today. The power of the Word and the leading of the Holy Spirit has brought you to this moment in time. And as a priest of God, I'm asking you, do not turn this off. Do not stop watching this. Do not take for granted what I've said. If you have not been to the cross of Jesus Christ, I don't care if you're a pastor. I don't care if you've got a worldwide ministry. I have come, as he has come, to bring liberty to the captives. So today, if you're not sure what to do, we're going to close this with this simple, three simple points. Number one, you must confess and repent of your sins. You must confess and repent of your sins. And here's what you need to understand. If you go to the base of the cross and you confess and repent of your sins, you're saying to God that you're committing the rest of your life to him. That you're walking away from his you're walking away from the behavior that's going to bring his judgment upon you and you have committed your life to him in covenant and he seals that covenant with the shedding of blood and the impartation of the Holy Spirit. There is no secondary route to this. You must, yes, you must be baptized. After you get saved, you must be baptized. That, and, and as quickly as you possibly can, get baptized. Because that's the symbolic gesture in this world that you're telling this world that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. You've been cleansed from your sin and you are washed, you are washed with regeneration, Titus 3.5. You have told the world that you no longer belong to it, that you're the property of God. So today, do you want to repent of your sins? Do you want the freedom and the liberty? How many alcoholics out there? How many drug addicts? How many people struggling with all sorts of maladies and diseases and afflictions? How many of you are in depression? Before you even consider taking your life, I submit to you that if you will put your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, you'll never, ever, ever regret the fact that you did. I have never met a man who truly gave his life to Jesus Christ and was sorry he did. I have never met a woman who truly gave her life to Jesus Christ and was sorry they did. I have never met a child, any child, 
past the age of accountability, that gave his life to Jesus Christ and was ever sorry they did if they passed through the cross. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, today we surrender our will and we ask that this message is somehow spoke and made clear your intention of this wonderful day in history that remains to this day as a source of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you and I pray that in no way, no how, did my will ever intersect, interject its purpose in yours? Father, I pray that Voice in the Wilderness Ministries is going to serve you in this regard going forward as we have started. That no matter what happens to us, to the best of our ability, we're going to do what you said. In the meantime, we need your help. We need people to preach to. We need people that will help us financially. We need people that will help understand our true purpose in this. And we ask you in Jesus' name for your help with us because in this world it will certainly not be easy and it will come with attacks and persecution just like it does for anybody that preaches the gospel. We ask that you guide us, that you lead us, that every person within the sound of our voice knows and understands the love of God that you gave us at the cross of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen and amen.